Good afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. Um, the first portfolio questions are to justice and the law officers. And in order to get as many people in as possible, we're grateful for short questions and answers wherever possible. Please, question one, Margaret McDougall. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will publish the business cases that were prepared in advance of the establishment of Police Scotland and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. Permanent Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, the outline business cases prepared for the reform of the Police and Fire Service were published in September 2011 and are available on the Scottish Government website. Thanks. Margaret McDougall. Thank you. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Would it not have been better to have a fully fleshed out public uh, business case published uh, at the outset rather than just having an outline one, given it the, the situation that we are now in with the Police Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the uh, outline business case set, set out in uh, considerable detail uh, both the uh, financial and non-financial benefits that would come from uh, police reform. It was also uh, used to inform the financial memorandum that went alongside the uh, police and fire reform uh, legislation as well. Uh, and as the Scottish Government also indicated to the Public Audit Committee, uh, it was important that we also move forward with the reform in order to realise the savings as early as possible, given the uh, uh, financial budget cuts we were experiencing from the UK Government. I think it's also worth keeping in mind uh, the views of the Auditor-General in this matter uh, when he stated, and I quote, given the stage of uh, police reform, it's my view that the financial strategy is the more important document for the SPA and Police Scotland to now focus their time, effort and resources into developing and that's exactly what Police Scotland are doing as part of the corporate strategy they produced last March and the work which they're now taking forward in their financial planning for the long term, which will, of course, be informed by the Comprehensive Spending Review when it's published later this year. Many thanks. Graham Pearson. Thank you, President Officer. It, it's before the time of the Cabinet Secretary, but he might be aware that we were promised a detailed business case. And there's no doubt that given the events of the last two years, such a detailed business case would have been helpful and we would know where we stand in terms of the savings. Minister. Cabinet Secretary Rowland. Uh, Senator Officer, my understanding is that in response uh, to a request from the Public Audit Committee, which goes back to December 2013, uh, the response from the Scottish Government was in reference to the work that Police Scotland were undertaking in relation to their corporate strategy, uh, which includes their financial planning, uh, for long-term financial planning within uh, Police Scotland. It was also uh, the government's view that to uh, delay the reform of police, uh, the police and fire service in order to develop a full business case would have actually limited the time in which some of the financial savings could have been achieved, given the financial pressures which existed at that particular time. But as I mentioned, the Auditor General has stated that the priority in moving forward at this stage in reform is the financial strategy. And that's the work which both the police and fire service are undertaking work on now, which of course will be informed by the Comprehensive Spending Review when it's published later this year. Many thanks. Question two, John Penland. The Scottish Government, when the Cabinet Secretary for Justice last met the Chief Constable and what they discussed. Secretary. I regularly meet with the Chief Constable and other senior officers from Police Scotland to discuss matters relating to policing and public safety. I last met the Chief Constable on 9th of September. Many thanks. John Penland. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response? Uh, Stephen House recently said in a newspaper article dated 28th of August that he could pull together an option that would completely balance the budget but questioned if this would be polit politically acceptable for the Scottish Government and the SPA. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell us what the Chief Constable meant by that and specifically what measures he is considering that might not be politically acceptable? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, to be frank, you'd have to ask the Chief Constable because he hasn't shared that information with me. Excellent. Margaret Mitchell. Deputy Presiding Officer, is the Cabinet Secretary concerned about, concerned about the high level of assaults on police officers as reported by the Scottish Police Federation, together with its comments that many of these prosecution charges appear to be downgraded or dropped? And can he confirm he has or intends to discuss this with the Chief Constable and the Lord Advocate? 
Well, it's important that we do consider these matters, and of course uh, the Lord Advocate is here as well uh, to uh, hear the member's uh, concerns on this issue. But of course, um, if the member feels there's an issue that she wishes to pursue further, I'd be more than happy to meet with her to discuss that matter in more detail. Many thanks. Rod Campbell. Thank you, President Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that one of the Chief Constable's greatest achievements has been the, the continued decrease in knife crime, with the recently increased crime statistics disclosing that crimes of handling offensive weapons have seen a decrease of 67 per cent since 2006-07? Cabinet Secretary. I think it is, uh, President Officer, worth keeping in mind that we have uh, recorded crime in Scotland at a 40-year low, and uh, Rod Campbell, I think, uh, makes a very important point in relation to the significant drop we saw in crimes of handling offensive weapons. I don't think we should also lose sight of the fact of the correlation that then has with incidents of homicide in Scotland as well, uh, where we saw uh, a reduction. Uh, but there's absolutely no doubt that we have saw significant progress in uh, recent years. Uh, one of the statistics that I think is very telling on the progress that we've made in issues relating to offensive weapons is that statistics last week showed that the number of young people under 19 convicted of handling an offensive weapon fell from 820, uh, 812 in 2006-07 down to 165 in 2013-14. That's a very significant drop of nearly 80 per cent, and I think that reflects the very proactive work that Police Scotland have been undertaking and the legacy forces in the past to make sure that we, under, we underline the risks and the concerns around ca carrying offensive weapons, and these reductions demonstrate the progress that's been made. Excellent. Many thanks. Neil Finlay. The Chief Constable, did he discuss the disappearance of coins worth over a million pounds from the National Museum uh, that it transpires may have occurred at a time when management opened the museum without adequate staffing as staff were on strike over weekend allowances? And does the Cabinet Secretary know if Police Scotland were involved in any risk assessment of a decision that has apparently resulted in national treasures being nicked? Cabinet Secretary. No, our conversation did not involve these matters. Thanks very much. Question 3, Gil Patterson. Uh, thanks very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the next steps in the process of the investigation into the death of Sheikho Bayou, uh, I, uh, please. Lord Advocate Frank Mahon. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Police Investigations and Review Commissioner uh, has now submitted uh, an interim report to the Crown, and as a result of this, further inquiries have been instructed. There remains further work to be done by PERC particularly in relation to the cause of death before their investigation is uh, complete. The family of Sheikh Ubayu have been kept advised throughout the investigative process and together with the legal adviser met with me and Crown Office officials on two occasions, the last being on the 26th of August 2015. That meeting gave me the opportunity to update the family and progress made to date, the further work that requires to be carried out and also to listen to and respond to a number of issues that they raised and I have reassured the family of my undertaking previously given that the inquiry will be thorough and will be completed as soon as possible. Thanks. Gil Patterson. Uh, can I thank the Lord Advocate for that uh, answer, please? And would the Lord Adv Advocate agree that it is important that the investigation is thorough, com completed as quickly as possible, and retains the confidence of the family of Sheikh Bayou? And would he care to comment on the role of, of Police Investigations and Review Commissioner in the investigation. Lord Advocate. I thank you, the member for the supplementary question. Yes, I would wholeheartedly agree that the investigation must retain the confidence of the family of Sheikh Bayou. Regardless of the outcome of the investigation, who can fail to sympathise with the family for their loss? And having met the family on two occasions, I know the effect that this tragedy has had on them and they have borne their loss with great dignity. They are right to demand answers, and a thorough, impartial and objective investigation is what they deserve. It is my job and the job of PERC to deliver a thorough, impartial and objective investigation delivered expeditiously without compromising thoroughness, and I am confident that this can be delivered. I note that Kate Frame, the head of PERC, and Sir Stephen House, the Chief Constable, have recently met the family, and I welcome this, and I note the positive welcome for this on behalf of the family. And I also note that Kate Frame has stated publicly that she's listened to the concerns of the family and will involve, involve them in the appointment of experts for the further work that has to be done in attempting to establish a cause of death 
I welcome this and have full confidence in part that this will be done. Finally, as I've confirmed to the family and in correspondence, regardless of a decision on criminal proceedings, there will be a fatal accident inquiry. A fatal accident inquiry is mandatory, Sheku Bayou's death being a death in custody. A fatal accident inquiry will allow all the evidence to be presented in a court, open to the public and the media, to be rigorously tested by all parties represented at the FAI, including the family, and will allow the sheriff to make findings in fact and recommendations in relation to Sheku's death in a judgment which will be available to all. Thanks. Briefly, if you could, please, Claire Baker. I um, have met with the Lord Advocate and corresponded with him on this, and I thank him for his willingness to do so. Can I ask the Lord Advocate to investigate why it took more than a month for officers who were involved in the incident to speak to Park? Um, the Cabinet Secretary has repeatedly said he doesn't believe it's due to a lack of powers on behalf of Park. Does the Lord Advocate then think this time delay was acceptable, and does he understand the reasons why, it, why that happened, why it took so long? Lord Advocate. I think that's a matter which uh, PERC are, are looking into uh, and uh, forms part of their interim report. As indicated, we still wait a final report. Uh, there are uh, evidential reasons for that. I don't think it would be appropriate, given it's a live inquiry, to, to go into that at this stage. But I'm aware of the members' concern uh, about this issue. I'm certainly aware of the family's concern about this is issue, and it will be certainly addressed going forward. Thanks. Question four, Ian Gray. To ask the Scottish Government when it expects net financial savings from the closure of local courts. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, the final phase, uh, phase of court closures was completed in January 2015, and by the end of 2014 15, the closures had already delivered net annual recurring cash savings to the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service of over £600,000 and time releasing uh, savings of over uh, £100,000. This also resulted in a reduction in outstanding backlog maintenance by over £2.8 million. And Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service are on track to deliver the estimated savings given during the public consultation process. These savings are being reinvested by SCTS, allowing targeted investment in a smaller estate to improve both facilities and technology. And the SCTS focus is on building a stronger court service which improves access to justice, reduces delays and costs and maximises the use of technology to improve services. Thanks. Ian Gray. Well, the truth is, uh, presiding officer, that uh, in Haddington, which closed in January, many months have passed. The court is still on the Scottish Court Services books, uh, and the commensurate maintenance costs continue to be a cost uh, against the court service. The truth is that any savings, uh, if at all already made, and any savings which can be made, uh, will be dwarfed by lost business in Haddington High Street, extra costs the incurred is... by police, social work and individual citizens trying to access justice. The Justice Secretary has made something of a reputation by reversing the dafter decisions of his predecessor. Will the Minister not ask uh, his colleague to reverse this one too? Minister. Um, it's worth stressing that, uh, as, as Mr Gray knows, these are operational matters of Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, but I do uh, recognise uh, the points that Mr Gray has made. I heard them myself in the course of the, the debate around the future of Haddington Sheriff Court. But what I would say to, to Mr Gray, clearly we're still working, uh, Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service are working with the local authority on, on legal issues in relation to the buildings itself. Um, I hear the point he makes about uh, savings uh, in terms of maintenance, but clearly uh, this is a long-term decision for the future shape of the delivery of court services in Scotland, and clearly the uh, intent is to dispose of the premises and to, to, to move on. Uh, reassure the member that also that the court business that has transferred from Haddington is on based on the evidence I've seen being dealt with uh, efficiently in the Edinburgh Sheriff Court. Many thanks. Gordon MacDonald. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can the Minister outline any measures that have been introduced by the Scottish Government to help deal with any additional pressures that may have been put on the remaining courts? Minister. Uh, that is a, a very fair point that um, Gordon MacDonald raises, um, Presiding Officer. Uh, the, the cases that have been uh, dealt with in, in relation to domestic abuse and uh, areas around uh, sexual crimes have led to an increase in activity in Edinburgh Sheriff Court and other Sheriff Courts. And the 
Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service and Scottish uh, Court and Tribunal Service have been uh, given additional resource uh, of £1.47 million to uh, provide sufficient cover to ensure that the human resources are there. It's worth stressing that this would have happened, been necessary even without the court closures. So it's not as a consequence of court closures, but as a result of the efforts being made by uh, Police Scotland and the Crown to try and encourage women and others to come forward to report cases of domestic abuse and to ensure those cases can be dealt with in our courts. So I reassure the member that resources, when they are required, are being provided. Many thanks. Question five, Alison McInnes. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on Police Scotland's restructuring and centralisation of the firearms licensing function. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Police Authority approved Police Scotland's proposal for the restructuring of their firearms licensing section at their meeting on the 27th of August. Uh, such decisions are rightly for the police and the authority. However, Scottish ministers have received an assurance that public safety remains a fundamental part of their considerations. Thanks, Alice McInnes. Cabinet Secretary, for that response. Until now, de dedicated firearms inquiry officers carried out in-depth inquiries into licence applications, their key role being to identify applicants who may pose a risk to public safety or indeed to themselves. The new centralised model involves the substantial loss of civilian expertise and the transfer of functions to police officers who are to do this on a part-time and ad hoc basis as part of their other duties. I would ask the Cabinet Secretary to address two areas of concern. Firstly, when there are spikes in police activity, major events or, or major incidents, will the firearms work be sidelined? And secondly, and perhaps more importantly, I understand that the training being offered to police constables taking over the role is at best minimal. Now, a few days in the classroom is no you substitute point, for decades of experience. Is the Cabinet Secretary absolutely confident that the new arrangements and training provision will not compromise public safety? Secretary. Uh, well, as I said to uh, uh, the member in my earlier response, is that we have sought assurances from uh, Police Scotland that public safety remains a, a central focus of the way in which they are handling firearms uh, certificate applications, and they have assured us that is the objective. One of the uh, aims of uh, moving to a much more streamlined and central approach to this is to make sure there is a consistency of approach in the way in which this is handled across the country, uh, because there were different approaches in the eight different legacy forces in dealing with these types of issues. Uh, I do understand that since the turn of this year, there have been some 350 uh, police officers who have gone through a specific training programme uh, in order to train them in undertaking this work around uh, firearm certificate uh, applications and uh, renewals and additional uh, administration staff are being provided to support this work uh, as well. It is worth noting, though, that that training, I understand, is not just a one-off. It is part of an ongoing training programme uh, that these officers will undertake in order to make sure that their, school, their skills are sufficient for the role which they uh, are undertaking. So I think it is important to recognise this about getting a more consistent approach and a much more effective and flexible approach um, as well. But of course, uh, the issue around uh, spikes when there are other demands on police time, uh, given that public safety continues to be a key part of how they're delivering uh, uh, the firearms certificate process, I would expect that to continue to be and maintained as a priority when it comes to dealing with these issues. Thanks very much. Question six, Lewis MacDonald. Government, how much additional resource it plans to spend on the police control room and service centre in Aberdeen in the current financial year? Secretary. On the 3rd of September, I announced that the Scottish Government, government will immediately make available £1.4 million to Police Scotland to support implementation of the recommendations arising from the HMICS interim report on call handling. It is for Police Scotland, with the oversight of the Scottish Police Authority, to decide on how this money should be allocated to the various activities required to implement the HMICS recommendations. Donald. The Cabinet Secretary confirmed that almost half of the highly trained mm -hmm. call handlers have left the service centre in Aberdeen since the beginning of last year. Does he accept that the report requires him to replace uh, those staff? Will he explain whether the provision he has made assumes that they will be replaced by recruiting and training civilian staff for the police service, by taking police officers off the front line to answer calls, uh, or by uh, using a recruitment agency to fill uh, positions on a temporary basis and on a casual basis? Uh, so Police Scotland are presently uh, reviewing their plans for the handover to the call centres, uh, including uh, the changes that were proposed in Aberdeen in order to evaluate how they can most effectively deal with the recommendations that have been made by HMICES. I understand that Police Scotland intend to exhilarate the recruitment of between 70 to 75 staff 
in order to support that transfer process. But in the meantime, uh, while they are recruiting additional staff for both the uh, Govan Motherwell Centre and for Bilston Glen, and also uh, staffing up the new Dundee Control Centre, uh, both the Inverness and the Aberdeen centres will remain in place. And it will only be after they have completed that transition planning, which has been considered by HMICS, that they will consider whether that actual final transfer date uh, will be completed within the existing timeframes that have been set. However, as HMICS has also outlined, is there needs to be a very thorough transition plan put in place, which will be considered both by the SPA and by HM HMICS before the final transition takes place involving the staff at Dundee and uh, the staff in Aberdeen. Many thanks. And that concludes portfolio questions to the Justice and Law Officers. I regret not being able to call more people. Um, we now move to the next set of portfolio questions, which is Rural Affairs, Food and the Environment. And I call on question one to James Dornan. Mr Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on discussions it has had regarding the reported decline in the bee population. The Secretary, Richard Lockhead, when you are ready. Mr Lockhead. <coughs> We are working closely with the honeybee sector on a strategy which aims to achieve a sustainable and healthy population of managed honeybees. Indeed, in recent years, we have seen an increase in managed stocks in Scotland. James Dornan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Uh, as well as uh, Marco G and I say, uh, the owner of the Battlefield Rest, the local restaurant, installing beehives in their roofs, I, I was recently presented with a petition put together by five-year-old Conrad House a pupil at Merrill East School, who managed to get over 150 signatures from friends, family and neighbours for his petition, bringing attention to the, to the importance of bees for the food chain. Will the, Minister, will the Cabinet Secretary join with me in welcoming this recognition uh, by my constituents of all ages of the role bees play, and would the Cabinet Secretary accept my invitation to come to my constituency to meet with Conrad and his family to discuss the petition further? Thanks, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you. I'm delighted to hear that restaurants in Battlefield are installing beehives on their roofs as indeed has the Scottish Parliament, with the Deputy Presiding Officer sitting here. Uh, and <clears throat> I think there is a raising awareness across Scotland uh, and indeed the world of the role our bees play in delivering food security, given I understand about a third of our food relies on pollinators. That is why I also congratulate young Conrad, uh, Mr Dornan's constituent, who has carried out very good work highlighting the importance of our bee populations. And of course, he's been doing that in his local community and gathering support for saving bees in his area. Uh, I know that we tried to set up a meeting previously, but I was unavailable when Conrad handed in the petition that he put together. Of course, I'd be happy, indeed delighted to meet him if the opportunity arises and if should I be visiting Mr Dornan's constituency in the near future. And I will ensure that is arranged. In the meantime, I'm sure we all congratulate Conrad and all other young people in Scotland for taking such a close interest in bee health. Excellent. As before, brief questions and answers will be welcomed. Jane Baxter. Thank you. The University of Stirling and the University of Sussex conducted research into planting wildflowers rather than grass on roundabouts and verges. This resulted in a spectacular increase in bumblebees and hoverflies. So I'm asking what the Scottish Government might do to support further initiatives like this to help increase and sustain our bee population. I'm uh, Thank you. I think the initiative highlighted... Uh, by the member illustrates the increasing work taking place across Scotland by a number of organisations and academic institutions uh, to promote bee health and that's why the government is supporting a bee health strategy. If there is more we should be doing, I'd be delighted to hear about such projects that perhaps require support uh, moving forward, but there is a number of support mechanisms in place already. Excellent. Question two, Kenny Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what input its Agriculture, Food and Rural Communities Directorate has into the work of Community Broadband Scotland. Both the Agriculture, Food and Rural Communities Directorate and the Digital Directorate helped shape the design of the broadband scheme which has been delivered by Community Broadband Scotland under the Scottish Rural Development Programme from 2014 to 2020. The broadband scheme was launched by the First Minister in Oban on the 24th of August. Many thanks. Kenny Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Obviously, broadband is essential for rural and island communities and businesses. Only yesterday, the internet in Arran, my constituency, was down for most of the day. Whilst next summer, 97% of Arran will receive superfast broadband, the 150 or so people in Macri will not, as things stand. What steps will the Cabinet Secretary and his colleagues take to ensure Macri is included in Arran's superfast broadband rollout? Uh, Kenny Gibson, 
quite rightly highlights the importance of broadband to rural communities and rural development, and it is great news that so, so many people in Arran are benefiting from the latest investment. Of course, the purpose of Community Broadband Scotland and the Broadband, broadband Scheme, uh, which is a separate scheme worth £9 million through so the Rural Development Programme, is to reach out to those communities who may not benefit from the wider programme in the more harder to reach areas, and that is a significant investment. Uh, the broadband scheme uh, refers to bringing various communities together to find their own solution and to support that, and Broadband Scotland is for individual community schemes. So I do hope that Mr Gibson's constituents are able to take advantage of these two significant funds so that all people on our island communities are able to connect to fast broadband. Does the Scottish Government intend to carry out an assessment of the number of online applicants for the single farm payment forced to use library and college broadband facilities due to slow broadband speeds or total lack of access to broadband? And can the Cabinet Secretary give reassurance that the Scottish Government will give appropriate support in the future to those who are affected? In terms of farmers and crofters applying for their online uh, applications for the farm payments, uh, extra additional support was made available at local regional offices uh, for those who could not have adequate broadband for their homes. And whilst I am willing to send these statistics of those that applied online for the new system uh, to the member, if I recall correctly, uh, the figure of overall applications online uh, was at least the same, if not higher, than the old system, despite all the doom and gloom expressed by, by many people. So it's uh, certainly the way forward, and we're giving adequate support, I believe, to ensuring that people are able to access broadband to apply online for the farm payments. Excellent. Tammy Scott. The Minister's answer in terms of the online applications that uh, uh, are increasingly be asked of by crofters and farmers, uh, what uh, is he going to do with Community Broadband Scotland to reach the areas that Kenny Gibson was mentioning, given that there are still many, many parts of the Highlands Lands where no such broadband is available at all? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as Tavish Scott will be aware, for many, many years there was enormous frustration in Scotland's rural communities over the lack of progress over broadband. Therefore, the substantial investment that has been made available over the last couple of years, which is making a huge difference to mainland and island communities, uh, is very much welcome. And that is why we also set up the specific funds Community Broadband Scotland to target those harder to reach areas that would not benefit directly from the main investment. So that's why we're working hard with the new broadband scheme, which is worth £9 million, as well as the existing community broadband scheme, to allow bespoke solutions to be found in our rural and island communities. Many thanks. George Adam, question three. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how the growth of Japanese knotweed is controlled. Absolutely. Thank you, pardon. Minister Ailey MacLeod. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Scottish Natural Heritage is lead agency for advising on managing <coughs> Japanese knotweed in Scotland. And much of that control work is undertaken by owners of land in which the plant occurs. And SNH encourages and coordinates action by other groups or bodies. Now, for example, the Tweed Invasives Project has been delivering comprehensive control of Japanese knotweed across the Tweed catchment since 2003. And Scottish Natural Heritage also have advice on their website for householders, much of which focuses on uh, long-term solutions that people can carry out for themselves. And in Scotland, you know, there is little prospect of eradication at present, but our strategy is to use public funds where appropriate to control the plant in priority areas and also to encourage landowners or householders to tackle the issue by providing them with good advice on control methods. Thanks, George Adam. I thank the Minister for her answer. It may surprise the Minister that many of my constituents have Japanese knotweed growing in land around their own properties. Unchecked, its potential to cause serious damage. Should it not be the case that the owner of the land of the Japanese knotweed, because in many cases the situation is that when minute Japanese knotweed appears, Minister, no one seems to own the land, uh, is growing. Should it not be the case that where the uh, Japanese knotweed is growing, and the, uh, they deal with the weed before it causes serious damage to private property? Minister. I have uh, great sympathy for those whose property is being affected by Japanese knotweed and you know I acknowledge that it can cause damage to property although you know I would add a wee bit of caution that some of the stories of its destructive force appear to be just a, a little bit exaggerated and in that sense what I'm referring to is that the GB non-native species secretariat 
For example, they have no evidence that it has ever been recorded growing through concrete, a claim that seems to be a favourite in some parts of the press. It is important to note, I think, that Japanese knotweed, it can be controlled and there is advice available and companies providing uh, this service. There may also be recourse in the courts for people whose property is damaged by it spreading onto the property uh, from elsewhere. However, I don't think it's practical or reasonable to be able to expect every landowner in Scotland to be able to clear their land of Japanese knotweed because while it would be extremely costly, it's also very unlikely to be able to eradicate the plant. Many thanks. Briefly, Jackie Bailey. Um, the Minister may well be aware that mortgage lenders have refused to lend on the basis of Japanese knotweed in, in the vicinity of certain households. Um, local authorities currently have no powers of enforcement, um, leaving it for the landowner um, to do. Does the Minister think that that should change and we should give local authorities power to enforce eradication? Minister. Well, the Council of Mortgage Lenders, they do state on their own website that lenders determine their individual policies on this issue and they take into account a range of factors when considering whether to lend and I have no reason to believe that this is not an accurate uh, representation. I also understand that some contractors can offer guarantees that some lenders will accept but ultimately lenders do determine their own policies and entering into a dialogue with them about what assurances they will accept is the way to find solution. But I do think that, you know, to make sure that we are taking a sensible approach uh, to the entire issue, I have asked the Scottish Biodiversity uh, Committee to prioritise species that we need to take action on, and specifically uh, Japanese knotweed is being assessed, along with other plants that you might also have some concerns about, like the giant hogweed and also Himalayan balsam. But I really I can't emphasise enough that I think that we need to be a lot more organised and strategic in dealing with these problems, I think we simply can't afford to carry out control where that effort will be uh, wasted. And I'm confident that this prioritisation will help us to do just that. Many thanks. Question four, Cameron Buchanan. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it plans to address the reported concerns of NFU Scotland regarding the effect of low prices on the farming industry. Cabinet Secretary. We are supporting a number of initiatives to mitigate the pressures currently faced by our farmers and crofters, and I have written to farming ministers elsewhere in the UK to stress the need for urgent steps to safeguard the industry. I do believe there is an unprecedented opportunity for UK ministers to agree a list of commitments, for instance, that supermarkets and the food service sectors can sign up to to support our food producers. The aid package, of course, proposed by Commissioner Hogan is appreciated at European level, and we are presently assessing what the package means for Scotland. Cameron McKenna. <clears throat> I thank the Minister for his answer. Low prices obviously have an effect on farmers' cash flow. Can the Minister therefore confirm that all single farm payments due in December will be made in December? Can Well, I very much appreciate that the current low prices and other factors facing our agricultural sector do uh, cause cash flow issues and that's why we are working flat out to do our best to try and ensure payments begin in the formal payment window uh, which is before the end of December and we will continue to work flat out to try and achieve that. Uh, of course, it's a brand new system. It's very complex. Other UK administrations are facing the same obstacles that we face here in Scotland. But I do recognise the importance of giving uh, this my full attention to help our farmers with their cash flow problems. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I certainly hope that we will see those payments before December. But in the meantime, in relation to the dairy crisis, um, what, work have you been do what work has the Cabinet Secretary been doing to accelerate implementation of the Dairy Action Plan, in particular in relation to work to support dairy farmers um, have new dairy products so that they can have fresh milk used and gain good money for it? Um, a lot of our dairy farmers are now facing uh, financial difficulties through lack of action. And I, I wrote to the Minister about this last month. Have yet to receive a response? Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> and I would use this opportunity to say to uh, members and, of course, the people of Scotland, the consumers, that we should get behind Scottish produce and help our farmers and food producers in their hour of need. And not only that, our 
Food service companies and our retailers should do a lot more to show loyalty to our home producers and get behind them, as I said, in their hour of need. In terms of specific help for the dairy sector, clearly there's a number of different levels at which we're attempting to help uh, our dairy farmers. Firstly, there's a the dairy action plan, which Sarah Boyack mentioned. We've already offered support to the, the Campbellton Creamery and First Milk to help provide it with a viable future. We are <clears throat> also working, as I said, with our retailers to try and increase sourcing of Scottish dairy produce. We are launching the International Dairy Brand for Scotland at the Anuga event in Cologne next month uh, and taking a number of other measures uh, as well. However, I do urge other UK ministers, and particularly Liz Trust, the Secretary of State for DEFRA, to inject a lot more urgency into this situation. If we can persuade jointly the food service companies in the UK and retailers to source a lot more home produce, that will help greatly in the short term uh, the industry, uh, and that is something we can do quickly if only with a lot more political will from Liz Truss. Tavish Scott, briefly. Please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister mentioned low prices, and you'll be aware that the first store lamb prices in the far north, including in Shetland, have been around £5 a head below last year's averages. Would he undertake to use some of the £500 million package that he mentioned from uh, Commissioner Hogan to assist those crofters and farmers, particularly where additional freight costs have been brought to bear because they've had to bring in more fodder as a result of the poor summer? Uh, well, I wish the, the 500 million euro package from Commissioner Hogan was just for Scotland, but unfortunately, uh, that's not the situation. And it's very likely, uh, to be frank, it will only make a modest contribution to helping us here in Scotland tackle the issues facing Scottish agriculture. Saying that, uh, Tavish Scott makes two good points. Firstly, we have to discuss with the industry. Uh, how to target any aid that does come to Scotland. And secondly, we have to recognise that the current problems face not only dairy farmers, but the sheep sector as well. And the Scottish Government have been great pains to persuade Europe of that, as well as the UK Government. Uh, I also am making the point to the UK Government, given how Scotland got a very raw deal over the overall EU farming budget, and then how the UK Government kept the uplift that was given to the UK because of Scotland's low payments, it's absolutely vital we get a fair share of the aid that does come to the UK to help tackle this crisis. It would be a complete travesty if, once again, Scotland did not get its fair share and we were let down by the UK Government, who failed to recognise the importance of agriculture to Scotland uh, and the case we have for a good share of that aid package. Many thanks. Question five, Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the Scotland Rural College regarding plans to close the Inverness Veterinary Laboratory since the Rural Affairs Climate Change and Environment Committee met on the 2nd of September this year. Cabinet Secretary. There has been contact at official level between Scotland's Rural College, the SRUC, and the Scottish Government staff since the Rural Affairs Climate Change and Environment Committee uh, on the 2nd of September, and I congratulate the committee on taking evidence on the subject, of which Rob Gibson, of course, is chair. SRUC provided an update on their appearance at the committee and outlined their initial plans for veterinary surveillance. The Scottish Government now awaits a more detailed update from them on their proposals on the change to the network of veterinary disease surveillance centres and the future of their own private business. Well, Gibson. Uh, I thank Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Does he agree that nothing should be done by the SRUC to undermine the services or the excellent skills offered by the staff at Drummond Hill Vet Lab Inverness? And I ask the Cabinet Secretary to seek agreement from the SRUC to stop any move of work such as serology from Inverness to Edinburgh planned for October until a final decision by ministers on the SAC plans to retrench into Edinburgh and close the Inverness site. Cabinet Secretary. Well, given the importance of having a proper and robust veterinary disease surveillance system in, in Scotland, I do, of course, urge the SRUC, as I'm sure they're doing, to heed seriously all the concerns that are being expressed to them by their proposals. The Scottish Government, of course, uh, funds part of their work and we have a strategic management board that will oversee their proposals and of course will continue to oversee their amended proposals uh, as we expect to receive shortly and the point of the management board is to reassure ministers that any new system that's put in place with any changes is adequate uh, for Scotland's needs. 
In terms of the serology work, that is a private commercial business that the College runs for its scheme members, and as such, the Scottish Government has really no influence on how that particular scheme operates. But on that subject, of course, I would urge the SRUC to heed the concerns being expressed about that service eh, as well, ensure they give an adequate response to MSPs and stakeholders eh, on that issue. Thanks. Adam Ingram. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the Auchin Crew facility in my constituency is all the, also under threat from SRUC's proposals. And this was also raised at the committee's meeting. Um, can you update Parliament on any discussions that uh, government officials might have had with Glasgow Vet School? Because in addition to Auchin Crew providing a very important facility to local farmers, it is also a key facility in the training of Scotland's vets uh, and in terms of disease prevention has played a crucial role in the past. Cabinet Secretary. Whilst I await the formal amended proposals from the SRUC, uh, I do know from my officials that conversations are taking place between uh, the Glasgow Vet School and the SRUC in response to some of the concerns expressed by local stakeholders and indeed Adam Ingram, MSP uh, and others. So clearly until I see the final uh, amended proposals, I'm unable to give any further details to Parliament, but I will keep a close eye on that and I urge Adam Ingram and others to continue to make the representations. Many thanks. My abject apologies to members whose questions I haven't been able to call. We have to now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion.